working a couple minutes ago. <laughs> All right, let's get going. So we are in Matthew chapter nine, beginning at verse 18. So Matthew chapter nine, verse 18. So what we're going to be looking at today is a uh, miracle within a miracle. We've got kind of two miracles, uh, one embedded within the other, uh, that we're going to be talking about and uh, the relationship between them. Um, what's going to be interesting in this in this collection of miracles is you're going to see both uh, the power, the majesty, the awesomeness of Jesus uh, in the miracles, but you're also going to see the compassion, the love, the sensitivity, both of those become uh, pretty evident as we go through the story. So let's start at verse 18. It says, while he spoke these things to them. So first of all, uh, we got to remember what he is speaking to them, right? He spoke these things, which kind of takes us back to last week's lesson, which was about answering the question, who can be forgiven, if you remember, right? And so he said the, the real, the short answer is in verse 13 of chapter 9. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And the real, the real uh, thing that he was trying to say there was that, you know, the sinners who understand, understand that they are sinners and go to Christ, they're going to be forgiven. But those that are self-righteous, who believe that they're just fine, those folks are going to be left out. So while he spoke those things, behold, a ruler came and worshiped him, saying, my daughter has died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. So again, we have the situation where Matthew, um, Matthew has one point, and that is to show that Jesus is God, to show that he is deity, etc. So he starts out talking about this girl, saying that she is dead and that he, Jesus needs to come and heal him. He's kind of giving the short version of the story. So we actually want to see the long version of the story. So we're going to go to Mark chapter five um, to, to look at the longer version to, to make sure that we get all the details about what actually went on here. <coughs> Mark chapter five, verse 22. Mark 5:22. So mine starts this way. It says, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell down at his feet and he begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So first of all, back in verse 22, uh, again, we see that word behold. Uh, again, that's a tickle word for us to say, hey, this is important. Uh, Jesus is trying to catch their attention, uh, or Matthew rather is trying to catch their attention, saying, hey, what I'm about to tell you is a pretty shocking thing. And the shocking thing is that this guy named Jarius, who is in, um, in Mark's word here, uh, uh, one of the rulers of the synagogue, it, it, the, the wording actually uh, is clarified in other places to say that he actually is most probably the highest ruler in the synagogue. Okay, so you remember you have the temple in Jerusalem, but then in the various cities you have these synagogues, and they would have uh, uh, leaders in them that would be in charge of the synagogue who, you know, decide who did what duties, et cetera, et cetera. And very likely then you have here Jarius, uh, who is the, at least one of the leaders, perhaps the, the head leader of the synagogue there in Capernaum. Remember, we're still in Capernaum. Um, and as a, as a leader of the synagogue, it would not be a stretch to believe that he's a Pharisee, uh, that, that he is someone who follows the law religiously, if you will. Um, he's the kind of person that would typically be uh, fighting against Christ, as we've seen over and over in other places who who Jesus would be condemning because of the the way that they think and act and the way that they treat others. So it, the, the shocking thing here is that this kind of person would come to Jesus. Uh, that that's a uh, that's just really surprising. And not only that, right? Not only that, 
when he saw him, he fell down at his feet. Uh, he fell down on his feet and worshipped him. Uh, I mean, this is a this is a beyond uh, uh, unusual uh, because one, even if it was a non Pharisee, even if it was not a ruler, for someone to fall down at his feet and worship him would be unusual, right? You only do that uh, to a deity. You don't do that to a man. So, so him falling down and worshiping him. Uh, is a clear indication that this man believes that this is some kind of deity. Uh, you know, does he know that he's a messiah? Uh, that's not unclear, but he certainly believes this is some kind of deity for him to fall down and worship him. Now, why is he doing that? That's kind of becomes clear in verse 23, right? And he begged him. So I'm in Mark chapter 5, verse 23. <clears throat> Um, so he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed and she will live. So here again in Mark, we see that he says that the daughter is at the point of death. In Matthew, it said that she was dead. Uh, uh, Mark here is probably more accurate because, again, uh, Matthew is just summarizing. Eventually, she does die. And so Matthew's not incorrect in saying that she's dead. But here we have the extended story when when the ruler actually comes to Jesus, he's saying, hey, my daughter is at the point of death. Could you come and heal her uh, such that, uh, you know, she will not die? Lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So so again, why is this why is this leader of the synagogue? Why is he coming to Jesus as a Pharisee? Why is he coming to Jesus? The only answer is he couldn't do anything else for his daughter, right? This is his daughter. This is, uh, you know, all his knowledge, all his training couldn't help him in this particular situation. His daughter was dying and and he was uh, reaching at straws. Uh, you know, to, to do this, for him to, to bow down before uh, Jesus here, uh, he's essentially giving up his... Uh, his position in the synagogue, the other Pharisees would be uh, turning their nose up at him. You know, he's, he's, he's turning his back on his establishment, his friends, his employers, because he was desperate. And that word's important. He was desperate in this particular situation. And when he was desperate, he turned to Christ because that was the only place he could go. And, and in fact, to make that a general statement, no one goes to Christ, no one accepts Christ unless they are desperate, unless they actually need him, unless they, unless there's no other way for them to solve their problem, whether that's a physical problem or whether that's a sin problem, right? Uh, you know, there's, I remember before I was a Christian, one of the and I, you know, I, some of you have not heard my testimony. I became a Christian while I was in college. And one of the one of the things I can remember in the conversations as I was uh, berating the Christians during that time, one of the uh, things that I would say, and they, well, that, that Christianity is just a crutch, right? If you can't make it on your own, if you can't do it, right? Uh, well, then you become a Christian. It's, it's for a bunch of wimpy people. And I, I guess what, I guess what I would say now is that's exactly right, <laughs> right? That, that is exactly what it is. It is a crutch. It is for wimpy people. It is for people who recognize that they're sinners. It is for people who recognize that they need Christ. It is for people who are desperate enough to go to Christ. <clears throat> and that's exactly where this, this man was with his daughter. He was desperate and he needed to go to Christ. But that is and we've talked about this some in, in, in previous uh, interactions here, but but the, there's got to be a desperation in going to Christ before someone is willing to repent, before someone is willing to turn their life over to Christ and let him be Lord and let him be in charge. So, so that's A, point A. Point B is um, he obviously believed Jesus could do this, right? And he says, you know, come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed and she will live. It, it's kind of amazing. So he's there in Capernaum. He's heard the stories. He's seen what happened. He has, you know, just seen the 
uh, demon possessed man. Uh, he's heard about that story. He sees the paralytic got raised in his own town, right? He's seen these stories about the, uh, you know, who can be saved and who can't be saved. And he believes that Jesus can do this. By the way, as far as our knowledge of Scripture goes, this had never been done before. No one had ever been raised from the dead before. You know, we we think about as we think about Scripture. Well, you know, Jesus is raising people from the dead all the time, and blah. You know, Paul's raising people from the dead. Right? We we kind of think that's a normal thing in Scripture. But at this point in time, this is early on in his ministry. Uh, as far as we know, no one has ever been raised from the dead before, and and so, so this for this. Uh, this leader, this synagogue leader, to not only trust Jesus, to to believe that uh, uh, he could heal his daughter and potentially raise her from the dead is just a fascinating uh, and, and shocking. So again, the behold in verse 22, as we hear the story of what's going on. All right, let's go on to verse 24. So verse 24, Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. <clears throat> so don't, don't miss the point that Jesus went with him, right? This man is coming to him. Uh, he's, he's begging Jesus to come and heal his daughter. And Jesus goes. Jesus is responsive. Jesus is responsive to this man's request. Uh, extend that. Jesus answers prayer, right? Uh, th th this is exactly what's going on. This man is is asking Jesus for something, and Jesus responds. He goes with him. And then you see that there's this great multitude followed him. Again, he's in Capernaum. He was just uh, in the <laughs> house uh, healing the paralytic. He goes down to the lake. We saw that the, the, uh, the crowd followed him there. Now this man comes up to him, this ruler, and the crowd continues to follow him. They follow him on to the, uh, they follow him on to his, uh, the house of this, of this ruler. Now, <clears throat> we'll go on to verse, um, yeah, let's go back, let's go back to Matthew. <laughs> uh, we're going to, we're going to look at all the Gospels uh, today at some point, just because it uh, tells the whole story. But go back to Matthew, because there's one word in here I want you to see um, in verse 20. Verse 20. You see in verse 19, it's uh, some in Matthew chapter 9, verse 19. It says, so Jesus arose and followed him, and so did all his disciples. And as we've seen in Mark, that so did all the crowd. Uh, and then in verse 20, it says, and suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. So the, it's just the word suddenly. Uh, you know, the, the, this woman breaks into what's going on. It breaks into this story. We have this story about... Uh, this daughter who, uh, you know, eventually is going to be raised from the dead. But uh, this this woman breaks into that story. It's suddenly, right? Now, I actually want to go to Luke and read the story here. Remember, Luke is the physician, right? So when we start talking about this issue of blood and all that, let's, um, let's go to Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> Verse 43 is where we pick up the story here. Let's start at 42, Luke chapter 8, verse 42. So again, Luke 8, 42, Jairus is again begging Jesus here. In verse 42, it says, for he, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But he, but he went and the multitude thronged him. So same situation uh, that we just spoke of. Now verse 43. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who has spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be treated. So this is an interesting, interesting verse. Uh, first of all, notice that it's a 12-year-old girl and this lady had a flow of blood for 12 years. I do not understand why those two numbers are the same, but it's at least intriguing to me that they are. You had this woman who was suffering for 12 years, and then you had this daughter who was healthy for 12 years and now all of a sudden is dying. It's just an interesting connection of those two numbers. I'm not sure what they mean. I didn't find a commentary who spoke on it, but uh, it's, it, it's clearly uh, those two numbers are, are important. Um, all right, so this woman, uh, uh, she has a flow of blood. What's interesting here is Luke, right, who is the physician, 
says that she spent all her livelihood on physicians and couldn't be healed, right? He's kind of slamming the uh, the doctors uh, as a doctor himself that no one could heal her. But you certainly get from that that this is some kind of uncurable disease that she had. Doctors said uh, she had spent all of her money on doctors. She could not be healed. It's unclear exactly what this flow of blood is, but it's, uh, it is very likely that it has to do with the uh, woman's time of the month, if you will. Uh, and the reason that I say that, um, if you go back to, <clears throat> if you go back to, we're not going to turn there. If you go back to Leviticus uh, um, chapter 15, uh, it, it talks about uh, uh, the woman's time of the month. And the, during that time, uh, the woman was unclean, right? And, you know, religiously unclean because of that. And as a result of that, she was untouchable untouchable by her husband, untouchable by her children. She, she essentially became, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, uh, she became untouchable, but she had, she had to stay away from the rest of her family during that time. Uh, and then of course, you know, normally that doesn't last very long, but for this woman, it lasted 12 years, right? So for 12 years, this lady is thought of as unclean. This lady is untouchable. She cannot attend the synagogue. She's seen as an outcast. She can't meet with her family. Um, you know, she's probably uh, you know uh, put up in a room or in a, in a closet somewhere uh, to deal with this. Plus, you know, it's got to be physically draining on her, right? Uh, uh, because of this, uh, you know, going on. So there's, there's no question that she is in a desperate. Condition. I'm going to use that word again. She's in a desperate condition. Um, so let's look. Where was I? I was in verse 43. <clears throat> let's keep going. Now, in verse, uh, let me read 43 again. Now, the woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed, came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately. Don't miss that. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped. Now, I'm not going to make you turn there, but in, in Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 21, it says, uh, she said to herself, if she could only grab his garment, she would be healed. So this, there's this picture of her following in the crowd, in this multitude, right? She sees Jesus. She thinks in her head, if I can just touch his garment, I can be healed. So she is perhaps grabbing at his garment, trying to get a hold of it. And the word touch here is a little bit too soft. Uh, it really should be grabbed. <laughs> she grabbed at the border of his garment. And you remember in those days, uh, you know, these teachers, uh, you know, that Jesus certainly was at this point would have a robe that would have tassels on the bottom. She's, she's trying to grab one of those tassels believing if she grabbed one of those tassels, which had which had spiritual significance in the, the Jewish faith, uh, that she would be healed. Now, we don't know exactly what she is thinking in her head. Is this, uh, is this some kind of uh, magic stuff going on here? What does she think about Jesus? She, her, her faith at this point is that Jesus can perhaps heal her if she can touch the garment, right? And then in verse 44, as we, we just read, he, she came from behind, touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. So immediately she's healed, she touches the garment, and immediately she's healed. Now this, this very strange reaction from Jesus in verse 45. So I'm in Luke, again, Luke 8, 45, if you've gotten lost. <clears throat> Luke 8, 45 says, and Jesus said, who touched me? Who touched me? <laughs> uh, when all denied it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the multitude throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? In other words, they're saying, everybody's touching you. What do you mean, who touched you? Verse 46, but Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Verse 47, now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. So let's go back 
to verse 45, Jesus said, who touched me? So why does Jesus not know who touched him? He knows. He did know. You think he did know? Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. So, so then. God, he knew. <laughs> so why does he ask the question? For the benefit of the crowd. <clears throat> point. It's a teaching moment. A teaching moment. Okay. But, keep going but, along that. What? Keep. What else? Why? Faith. I didn't hear you. To show her faith. That you know. I mean, he's. She truly believed, and, um, you know, I think it was for her benefit, but also for the benefit of his disciples and the crowd to see the, the mm -hmm. faith of this woman, you know, and also I think she needed to be recognized that she was healed um, so that she would not be ostracized anymore. Good. She pro he pro also probably wanted to, if she was healed, make sure it was a realization that it came from touching him. Good. To prove that nobody else knew. It, it, I'm sorry, say that again. To, to prove that nobody else, not even the disciples, knew who it was and that he's the only one that knew. Good. Well, if he had not called it out, then she would have been healed and she would have been the only one who knew and the the opportunity would have been lost um, to make it public to the crowd to make it known what what had happened good <clears throat> all right let me let me say a few uh, so a lot of good stuff there thank you uh let me just add a few other things back when he when he says who touched me and he you know, said in verse 46 again, somebody touched me, I perceived power going out from me. One other way to think about that is God stepped in and healed this woman, right? And it may be that Jesus in his humanness didn't know it, but Jesus in his divinity did know it. And this is this is a little bit bizarro here, but it, it could very well be that he's going, whoa, what just happened? God did something through me. God healed this woman. And uh, so it, it's humanness maybe saying, or who was that? There may be a little bit of that. Now, most of you are going to reject that and go, no, no, he's God. He knows everything. But I'll, I'll, just, I'll just lay that on at you for, for pondering. Because I'm going to come back to it in a few minutes. Um, so, so then she, he, 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 uh, he makes her come forward. He makes her give a testimony, right? As it says there, uh, in the presence of all the people, she has to give this testimony of that that she had been healed previously. It may very well be that <clears throat> she touches him thinking, hey, this guy can heal me. Jesus wants to give her the opportunity for her faith to grow, right? Her faith is somewhat magical at this point. Just stay touched, I'll get healed, blah, blah, blah. But he wants to make sure she knows more about who he is. So she gives him, she gives her this opportunity to give testimony, to say, no, this was Jesus who did this. He had the power to heal me, and I'm healed because of him. All right, let's just leave that for a minute because I'm going to, again, come back to this. There's, there's something in this story that I've never seen before that I'm about to expose to you that kind of changes my thinking around this whole thing. So let's look at verse 48. <clears throat> So she comes forward, she gives this testimony, and then he says this in verse 48. He said, he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So 
first of all, he uses the word daughter, right? A very intimate term, a very compassionate term, a very loving term for this woman, you know, whom he, who he has not met before. He calls her daughter. It's, a, a, again, a very intimate term. And then he says, be of good cheer. Have we heard that before? Anybody remember where we heard that? Besides the Christmas story? <laughs> shepherds? Yeah, besides the shepherds, right. If you go back to, uh, if you can hold your fingers there, because we're coming back. If you go back to Matthew chapter 9, uh, in, in the healing of the paralytic, it's right at verse 2. Chapter 9, verse 2. Mine says, then behold, they brought him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. All right. So again, he uses that intimate term, son or child, be of good cheer. And then he says, your sins are forgiven you. All right now, go back to Luke chapter 8, verse 48. And here he says, daughter or child, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your faith has made you well. What faith did this daughter express that made her well? You remember the paralytic, right? His friends, see, they drop him through the roof. I mean, it was pretty obvious their faith when Jesus said, uh, you know, you are forgiven. But what's going on here? Your faith has made you well. well Anybody want to take a step? Like Curtis, go ahead. I said they both wanted to be right there in the presence of Jesus. They were both desperate, and they both went to Jesus, no question. So they had the desperation part. I'm trying to get on. What about the faith part? Where's her faith? Is it with action? They, they knew that Jesus would heal them. They just knew it. She had yeah. to do it. But it's she like faith to, with action. Yeah, she had to actually do something. She, she actually had to reach yeah. out. Faith with action. So her reaching out and touching his garment was uh was why she was healed or why she was made well when, when we were talking about the paralytic you, you made the point that he was he was reaching out for physical healing but he was also reaching out for salvation he was, he was reaching out for spiritual healing so she was this woman was doing the same she was she was reaching out for her spiritual healing as well as physical healing. All right, let me let me show you something uh, that's going to blow your mind. Um, go back to Luke chapter seven. Luke chapter seven, verse forty-four. <clears throat> Luke chapter seven, verse forty-four. Here it says, uh, this is, we're in the middle of a story, but you'll remember it as we get into it. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much but to whom little is forgiven the same loves little then he said to her your sins are forgiven and those at the table with him began to say to themselves who is this who can even forgive sins now look at verse 50 it says then he said to the woman your faith has saved you go in peace now the interesting thing is this word in verse 50 
that is uh, translated as saved is the same word in verse in chapter eight, verse forty-eight, that is translated, "Your faith has made you well." So you so go back to eight forty-eight. You could read this, "Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has saved you." It's exactly the same phrase as we see in Luke chapter 7. One more thing I want to show you before I talk about the implication of that. Luke, go to Luke chapter 17. Running out of fingers. I'm sorry? A lot of fingers. Out of fingers to keep <laughs> yeah, we'll just keep Luke 8. That's the one we're going to go back to. But Luke 17, verse 11. Here we have the story of the 10 lepers being healed. So verse 11, Luke 17, 11. Let me read that to you. It says, now it happened that when, when he went up to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him 10 men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourself to the priests. And so it was that as he went, they were cleansed, okay, or they were, they were healed of their sickness is what that word means. Then verse 15, and one of them, one of the ten, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. He fell down on his face with his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, where, where the, were there not ten cleansed? But where are they? Where are the nine? They can't read. Uh, were they? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to them, "Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well." Again, the phrase there is exactly the same as saying, "Your faith has saved you." So here you have ten men who were healed, but only one man who came back and glorified God, and he was saved, okay? So there's a distinction that's, that's made in Scripture between the healing and the saving, and I think what we have here, now going back to Luke chapter 8, what we have here with this woman is that distinction. Because you remember when Jesus, excuse me, when the woman touched Jesus' garment, she was healed immediately. But then in verse 48, he says, your faith has made you well. I think the faith that he's talking about is what she said in verse 47, is the testimony, is her saying it out loud, is her saying that it's Jesus that did this. She's not hidden anymore. She's declaring it in public. Uh, and, and he's saying you, you had your faith, uh, you're, you're showing your faith and your faith now has saved you, go in peace. So yeah, going back to what Rick was saying earlier, What's going on in these situations is not only healing, but also salvation. And in here, there is actually a, a separation of those two events. She's healed first, probably had a, uh, a, a smaller faith, right? Then when she does the testimony, it has to say that loud, has to say it in front of the people. Jesus recognizes this as saving faith, and she is then saved because of that faith. Hey, hey Rich. I, yeah. Uh, um, when you mentioned the verse in Leviticus, I just went back and looked at that, and it was it was interesting that that they said after a woman, you know, whatever it stopped, the bleeding stopped, that on the eighth day she had to go to the the priest and present a sin offering, which was really interesting. I mean, why well, you know? So it's, right. a, it's kind of an interesting tie-in that they 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 looked at sickness as sin. You did something and. And that kind of, I think, ties into it, too. So. Right, exactly. We've talked about that many times, right? The, the Pharisees certainly connected those two things. Sickness and sin were connected together. So, yeah. All right, any other thoughts or comments on that? That that just was a, a important clarity we need to get on what's going on in these verses. You okay with that? Not even. So. All right. Let's go on then to verse 49. We're going to go back to the other story. It says, while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Right. So 
he is he was on his way to the the ruler's house who had the daughter that was dying uh he gets interrupted by this woman uh who he uh, heals of this issue of blood and now someone comes from the ruler's house and saying hey uh you know your daughter now has died uh don't trouble the teacher anymore uh you know that you know uh, we 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 approached him for healing, but now the daughter is dead. It's too late. Uh, there's nothing that can be done, right? Um, I, I I will ask this question. Do I'm trying to figure out how to ask the question, because many of the commentaries say, "Hey, this was intentional on Jesus's part to slow roll." his visit to the ruler's house, such that the daughter would be dead, such that he could raise her from the dead. I, I don't know the answer to that question, right? To be honest with you, but it is intriguing to at least think about that, that, uh, you know, this was an, an opportunity for Jesus to raise someone from the dead, to show again his deity. It's certainly in Matthew's, uh, 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 you know, uh, treaties to try to to get that kind of information across. But, you know, Matthew, Luke, John, uh, uh, and Mark all tell the same story about uh, about this uh, daughter who has, has, you know, was sick, who died, and then we'll see Jesus raising him from the dead. So I actually want to go back now to, um, to Matthew and finish the story there. Hey, Rich. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. I remember the story of Lazarus, and I remembered when I was studying that story that they did make the point that he had been dead for whatever it was, three days, and that Jesus had done that on purpose because he wanted only God to be, give, be given the glory, that nobody could say that it was, oh, well, he really wasn't dead, you yeah. know, that it <clears throat> that he really, truly wanted um, God to have the only glory in that situation. Yeah. So I could see that where he might have slowed himself down for that. Yeah. Well, okay. you know, go ahead. And I, and I, going back to a point you made earlier that I don't know, I don't know if this is one of those that you're going back to, but you brought up the, the question as to Jesus was going to the guy's house to heal his daughter. And is there the possibility that God intervened, had the lady touch the robe and stop him so that was that intervention? If the lady hadn't touched the robe, he gets to the guy's house on time and just heals the daughter as opposed to raising the daughter from the dead. So there's a there's a good comparison there to say, well, who did God intervene and say, you know, make that lady touch the robe to slow him down? Yeah, it, it, it does bring into question. It makes you just think. Yeah. Hey, was was there a divine intervention there? Yeah. <laughs> right, because Jesus wasn't divine, but there was a divine <laughs> intervention. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. I, this, this is the this is the problem we have with Jesus being 100% God and 100% man. Yeah. It doesn't fit in our little brains. But but because I'm Dave, I'm with you, Dave. I, I, that makes sense to me. But uh, you know, I'm sure someone in the room is is like, no, 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 that can't be. They're not right. But you know, yeah, I get it. It's, it's like son, you're moving too fast. Slow you down. I'm yeah. sorry. I say it's like son, you're moving. You're walking too fast. I got to slow yeah, you down. Right. 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 All right. Any other comments on this before we? So I'll I'll jump in on that on on that a little bit in the omniscience of God, and sometimes I I struggle with those kind of if things because of God's omniscience. I kind of think, okay, God knows the plan, <laughs> and uh, but it, like you said, our our brain can't wrap around all that stuff, a lot of this stuff, and of how God actually works and knows, the, you know, just knows everything and how everything's going to come out. And, but yeah, it is interesting. And, and you know, to add to that, right, um, if, if what we're saying is true, then God let this little girl die for a different purpose, right? That, that has a lot of uh, important thinking on our part. You know, why does death occur? Maybe it's for a different purpose. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe there's someone else who needs to learn a lesson. Maybe there's someone else who needs to be touched. So or maybe it's for the glory of God, period. It's just for the glory of God, like in this case. Absolutely. Yep. God's never early. He's never late. He's always on time. We're the ones that have 
the work perspective. Yeah. Good. You know? Yeah. 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 And Rich, also, there's there's no coincidences with God. Even the bad is work for good. He orchestrates everything. Right. It didn't surprise God that the woman came up and touched Jesus' garment and slowed him down, right? <laughs> there's none of us that are thinking that. All right, let's go back to, to Matthew chapter 9. We'll pick up the story at verse 23. <clears throat> All right, so when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping, and they ridiculed him. So so there's a bunch of flute players and a noisy crowd. So, you know, in these days, uh, part of the tradition was they actually had hired mourners. Uh, they had these people that would come in. They were professional mourners uh, when someone died. So, by the way, this also says that uh, it's been a couple of days because the funeral is already in progress. You know, the funeral would typically take several days and it'd be several days after the person died. So the funeral is taking place. They got these professions. You know, when we go into the funeral parlor, it's very quiet, very hushed tones. Uh, not exactly the same situation here. You got these uh, professional mourners, typically women, who are crying and screaming and calling out all of the relatives who have ever been killed and uh, or ever died rather um and uh you know so so jesus he comes into the room and says okay folks out of here uh, make room get out for the girl is not dead but sleeping and of course their response is they ridiculed or some of the uh, uh gospels say they laughed right they're they're just they're you got to be kidding me we're professionals we we <laughs> we know when a person is dead and then they're not dead uh, you know, we've been around a lot of dead bodies here, uh, and, and this girl is dead. She's not asleep, and they just ridicule him. Um, you know, it, it, it is, I, I don't miss uh, this picture of death as sleeping, right? Uh, a person who has died is sleeping, but they can only be awakened by Christ, Right, either in this particular case, in that very moment, or uh, in the life after. Only, only Jesus is going to wake them back up. Only Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Uh, the, you know, again, what is Matthew trying to teach here? Matthew's trying to teach this is God, this is deity, this is the God who is the resurrection. This is the God who who will raise everyone at the end times. We'll see that at the at the end of Matthew. So he's setting that up and saying, yeah, he's going to raise everyone. And let's just show you, let's give you a proof. How am I going to prove to you that this is God who can raise us all in the end? Well, let me go ahead and raise someone from the dead. That'll show it to you. Let, let me just raise someone from the dead to show you he has the power over death. All right, let's keep going. <clears throat> in uh, verse 25, when the crowd was put outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Of course, if you go into Mark or Luke, right, it says uh, there uh, that he spoke to her, said, little girl, arise, right? Uh, Luke actually says uh, that her spirit came back to her again, uh, which is an interesting picture, too, of... Uh, of what went on here, but he took her by the hand and the girl arose. Uh, uh, and then verse 26, the report went out to all the land. Uh, Jesus actually, again, in the other gospel says, you know, let's not tell anybody about this. Uh, but, it, but, but in every case, the report went out to all the land uh, because he's already got this crowd, this multitude, uh, you know, everything going on uh, that, that he's been a part of. All right. So, so let me just make some, general statements about all this uh just to, to kind of wrap all this together because it's it, it's a fascinating set of things first of all let's look at jesus here jesus first of all he's accessible right i mean when god becomes man god becomes accessible and, and jesus is walking down this road and uh uh you know some man comes up to him and says come and see my daughter right this lady touches him behind. Jesus is accessible. 
we get, we, you know, later we see the little children coming to him. The crowds are always with him. So he's, he's accessible. And all these things that are true of Jesus then are true of Jesus now. Jesus is accessible. Jesus was also available, which is a little bit different because when the man came, he went, right? He went to his house. He didn't just listen to him. He went. He responded. He was available. He responded to the... Uh, um, to the to the the lady that touched his uh you know he 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 turned around in the midst of the crowd the crowd all moving forward he stops he turns around he speaks to the woman he gets her testimony he pronounces that she is saved i mean th th that he would pause and do that is uh an, an important characteristics the third thing is important and i haven't said anything about it yet the impartiality of christ is shown here right we have Two very different people that he has dealt with. He's dealt with the leader of the synagogue, right? And then he's dealt with this woman who's an outcast. Now, there are some of us who would think, man, don't waste your time with this woman. We got this leader that we really need to help out. If this leader could see who you are, think of the impact that he could have. Think of the number of people who would follow if we would... Yeah, if this leader would come to Christ, if he would understand salvation. <clears throat> Jesus never thinks that way. <clears throat> listen, I, I listen, I've thought that way before. You know, if this if this uh, uh, important uh, um, uh, sports person or this important uh, uh, movie star came to Christ, wow, what an impact they're going to have. Jesus doesn't think that way at all. He thinks this is a person. This is a human that needs me. Whether that's a rich leader of the of the synagogue, or whether that's just an outcast woman, the impartiality of Jesus is very shockingly clear in these two uh, uh, the, these two things. The other thing recognize that the touch of Jesus, uh, the woman touched his garment, uh, who was untouchable. He touches the girl to raise her up. His his caring his 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 uh, compassion just is uh, dripping off of these two uh, experiences that he has here. Well, and of and course, go ahead. And Rich, both of the experiences, they're unclean. If a person's dead, they're unclean. Person yeah. bleeding, they're unclean. So the, the physical touch of Jesus is just, it overcomes death, you know, and overcomes despair and hopelessness. And I think that's, you know. Yeah, and we, we've talked some about this when we talked about the leper. Remember, you know, to touch a leper would make the person who touched them unclean, right? So to touch this woman would make that person unclean. To touch a dead body would make that person unclean. So in all these situations, you could say that Jesus was making himself unclean, which of course he wasn't because his power was overcoming all that uncleanness and making them clean uh, because he is God and he has the, uh, you know, the holiness and power of who he is. So, yeah, that's an important thing to think about, that just the, the way he overcomes uncleanness in, in all of these situations. And, of course, the, you know, the last part of his character here is just his power, right? I mean, showing that he has the power over death and is therefore God uh, is the big message that Matthew is trying to get across, and we'll see that. Uh, continued as we go on to some other miracles in the weeks ahead. But he has the power over death. He demonstrated the power to reverse the curse of death. Right? To reverse the curse of death. He has shown that power. He is shown, uh, again, the power to raise everyone in the last day. Uh, th this is the way that he's doing it. The other thing I just want to remind you of is what are the requirements for salvation that are exposed here. Number one, desperation, right? Desperation, both of these people were desperate. Um, you know, sometimes I think we get, we've talked about this before, we've made salvation too easy. Uh, we, we have trouble sometimes getting people to walk down the aisle to express that they're saved. <laughs> Why? Because they're not desperate. Somehow we've emotionally convinced them it would be a good idea to join other people and be part of the church, blah, blah, blah. Rather than 
helping them to see their desperation in the situation that they're in, right? These people saw that they were desperate, not only desperate in their sickness, but desperate uh, in their uh, separation from Christ. So desperation is clearly an important part of salvation. And then the second one is, tr is, is uh, faith, right? Uh, and uh, their faith that, that they could trust Jesus, their faith that uh, he was the only answer. Their faith when all of their other things that they've tried, all of the, the religious stuff that they were a part of could not make it. Uh, uh, they had faith in him. Hey, Rich. Yeah. Rich, so how do I balance? Oh, I didn't mean to talk. Go ahead, CT, and then there was somebody in the room. Oh, okay, so how do I balance my desperation or the desperation of, or the my, a level of desperation? Um, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to, I was saved when I was a kid. And I'm not sure how I, I would re realize I was desperate or maybe that, maybe that's a, just a, a strong word or it's just not in my head right now. What, I, maybe I was desperate. I was at a youth, you know, retreat and, and I under, understood what I needed to do. And does that, so does that make me desperate or I mean, how does that, how do I balance that desperate? Yeah, I, I would take us back CT to poor in spirit, right? So when I say desperate, I mean poor in spirit, right? It, it, it's, it's a recognizing that we're sinners, recognizing that the only way out of this is through Christ. So, you know, so if, if as a youth, you recognize you're a sinner and you realize that you need in Christ in my life, that's the desperation I'm talking about. Gotcha. There was somebody else in the room. Yeah, Rich, I was um, I was unsure. I know they both had desperation, but in the story of you know bringing the young daughter back to life, we don't know that there was any salvation that took place in any part of that story. I mean, they actually laughed when he said, "Stop weeping," for she, you know, has not died. They thought that was absurd and began laughing at Jesus. So yes. where was the faith there that there was any salvation in that story? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, Melody. That's exactly right. We don't know. We don't know if the if the ruler was saved. We don't know if the daughter was saved. We don't know. There's not enough details to give us that clarity. You're right. I think you have to go back to the beginning of that that story with the ruler. His his first action in the presence of Jesus was he knelt and worshiped him. Well, good point. Good point, Rick. Yeah, that may be sufficient. It's good. All right, anything else there? All right, I wanna end, <clears throat> since we haven't looked at the Gospel of John, I wanna end there. So go to, go to John chapter five. <clears throat> Maybe we might as well look at all the Gospels when we're looking. I'm not going to look for this particular story, but just when Jesus talks about death in, in the Gospel of John is enlightening. So John chapter 5, verse 21. <clears throat> John 5, 21, we'll start there. It says, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And look at verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. But I want you in John, go to chapter 11. <clears throat> Chapter 11, verse 25. <clears throat> but you know this one, verse uh, 1125. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never, shall never die. Do you believe this? I love, I love that, right? Do you, do you actually believe this? 
that whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I heard one of the one of the commentaries gave a great <clears throat> picture of death that I had not heard before. Uh, that I just wanted to share with you, and that was uh, after someone dies, the rest of us are like a crowd of mourning caterpillars, right? Holding a chrysalis and crying over the chrysalis while a butterfly is up on the top of a flower, a beautiful, wonderful flower, looking down and saying, why in the world are they mourning over that chrysalis? <laughs> right? I, I think that's an interesting picture of, uh, of death. I thought I would share that with you. A mourning, a crowd of mourning caterpillars. <laughs> that's what we are. All right. Any other thoughts on any of this? I just can't help, and I've thought about it before. Think, I mean, if you just think about our time every second, think of how much God is born every single second. I mean, it's like we would say we're bombarded with stuff, but I mean, He's healing people every second, He's listening to millions of prayers every second. I mean, just imagine what God, what, how many people go to God every day so many different requests it's just amazing how god handles i mean just that's just who he is yeah and we can't handle five things and he's handling trillions of things at the same time yep good reminder who god is absolutely anything else good so rich did uh just to stir the pot so did you have another example of a crowd of uh, morning caterpillars? What about the concern of the person who's going to hell at this point that, especially family members, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just poking at you a little bit, but you know, I just, that, that is a burden. Um, sure, sure, of course. Um, and, and poke away, it, it was just a, just a little analogy. <laughs> no, 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 it's it's great. I think it's it's cute. I just yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. This is true. I guess that should be the thing that spurs us on to you know witness, yes, but also maybe um, try to be sure or at least give. Uh, testimony to the Lord for, you know, praying for the Holy Spirit um, for those, especially our loved ones, yeah. who don't know the Lord, especially the stubborn ones who don't want to know the Lord. Right, right. Because they got it all. They told them, you know. Yep, yep. Good. Uh, I was just poking at you a little bit. So it was, it was a cute example. <laughs> yeah, the morning caterpillars only go for uh, for those who know the Lord. Absolutely. Right. All right, anything else? As we'll move into prayer time. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see. Let me just start with us. Uh, as we've said to some of you, Joe is doing well. She's in the other room listening to all of this. Stop uh, your recording. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How do I do that? Uh, stop recording. Okay. 